We all know about the danger of strangers. We hear stories about never getting in cars with people we don't know. We're warned not to take the candy, but what about the stories we were never told? This video explores those stories. Before we begin, if you think you might fall asleep, please introduce yourself in the comments. Please also like the video and subscribe if you haven't already. I'm always interested in knowing what country everyone is from, so let us know in the comments and share what time it is where you are. Thank you once more for joining me. Get cozy, grab a glass of water, turn the lights off, and make sure you've locked your door. Don't forget to say hello in the comments. It's time to close your eyes. The following story took place 20 years ago. The dialogue is paraphrased but accurately conveys what happened. Every year during March, my family would drive roughly two hours into the city from our rural town to enjoy a college basketball tournament. We routinely stayed at a large reputable hotel and we were no strangers to the city. However, this year was different. There had been a rash of violent muggings, leaving many severely injured. I remember reading about these attacks in the newspaper. I've always enjoyed reading the news, even as a young child. The reports about the city would scare me more than usual because I wasn't used to the threat of violence so close to home. It was Saturday night around 11 p.m. and my mom, dad, and my little sister were winding down and preparing for bed. It's worth mentioning at this point that my mother is naturally paranoid, much more so than other moms. While it can be annoying at times, it often leaves us prepared for bad situations. Tonight would be one of those times. I was sitting on the second of two beds, furthest from the entrance to the room, when there was a knock at the door. Room service, a voice called out. My parents glanced at each other, and my mom motioned for my dad to look through the peephole in the door. We didn't order anything, said my dad, as he sized up the short, stocky male standing outside our door. He had with him a trolley with what appeared to be a meal on it and was wearing a green hotel uniform. Are you sure? He responded. I've got an order here for room 4109. The guy at the door didn't sound pushy or out of place at all. In fact, if it wasn't for the recent violence in the city, we probably wouldn't have had our guard up in the first place. However, that night my parents were certainly cautious, and my father firmly told the man at the door that we didn't order any food. He left politely, without incident. We had little reason to be suspicious, and my dad wanted to chalk it up to a mistake on the hotel's behalf and get to bed. However, my mother eventually persuaded him to call the front desk to check that everything was legit. Fifteen minutes or so after the man had left our door, my dad got off the phone with the front desk. They have no record of us ordering food, and their room service staff were white, not green, he said grimly. I noticed my mother's face widen and my sister looked scared. The hotel immediately sent security up to our floor to see if the intruder was still around. They checked on us and then went about searching the floor. Security came back to our room a few minutes later, telling us they had found an empty trolley in the stairwell, but there was no one to be found. With that, they departed and we triple checked the locks on the door before eventually sleeping. The next morning I was the first one awake. I didn't want to turn on the TV and wake my family, and there was no newspaper in the room, so I booted up my dad's laptop and checked the local newspaper's website. The first headline immediately made my stomach twist. Man stabbed outside City Hotel. Apparently, at roughly 11.30 the previous night, right after we had turned away the fake hotel employee, a pedestrian had been attacked outside our hotel in the middle of the sidewalk. He had been stabbed twice and then badly beaten in plain sight, yet his wallet wasn't stolen. The article went on to say that there was no apparent motive for the mugging, it was pure violence for violence's sake. It also mused as to why the pedestrian had been stabbed to the point where he couldn't fight back, but then beaten by hand. I woke my parents up right away and showed them the article. My mother became very nervous, while my dad looked very angry and reached for the phone. 
Naturally, we contacted the police and told them our story about the previous night. We provided as much information about the man at our door as possible, thinking he may have been responsible for the assault, but no one was ever caught. Thankfully, we had several inches of locked door between us and the fake employee. It may have just saved our lives. This happened to me during the summer of 2017. I was a 19-year-old girl at the time. I will be vague regarding details, country, origins of people, names of places, to avoid being recognized or causing a bad reputation to any community. While it isn't really scary, this story is still creepy, and the end is so crazy that I still can't believe it to this day. I was living in an apartment with my family. In the parking lot, there were always several guys repairing cars. I would often get home late at night and see these guys just talking. They would sometimes say good evening, and one time joked about keeping me a parking spot, but nothing inappropriate. I would just answer politely. I had noticed that one of them had a tuned-up sedan and must have been living in the same building, but used a different entrance, because in the morning the car was parked there. It was really recognizable. One morning, I was heading to work and realized this car was parked next to mine. Since he didn't live far, it wasn't that weird. But when I sat in my car, I realized the owner was actually sitting there, looking at me and smiling. Well, okay, it's 8.30 am, it's not completely out of the ordinary. I started to drive to work and entered a special roundabout where you have to stop inside if a car on the right is coming, so I stopped. I was looking to the right to see where I could go and realized that in the second lane, the car was there. As soon as I took the road to work, he was behind me. Even when we got close, he was still there. I was working in a mall with the biggest hypermarket in the neighborhood, so I thought maybe he was going for groceries. I got into the underground parking lot and parked. He did the same, right next to me. I chose to ignore him and headed for the escalator. He did the same and started to talk to me. Hello, I'm Steve. And you? I'm Anna. How old are you? I'm 19. I'm 27, is that a problem? No, why would that matter? Okay, so you work here? We arrived at the place where I worked. Yes. Okay, well, see you tonight. At that moment, I realized he wasn't speaking the language well. I answered his questions because he didn't seem scary and I didn't want to make a scene. When he said bye, I thought, yeah, I see him every night in my parking lot with his friends, so it's normal. But when I finished work, the exact same thing happened as in the morning. While I sat in my car, I realized the guy was right next to me. Surprised and seeing how eager he was to talk, I got out and asked, what are you doing here? I have something for you. He had a big smile and approached me. What? No. He gave me a red rose. Embarrassed and shocked, it was the first flower anyone had ever given me. I refused it a couple of times, but he kept insisting. I knew the only way to get rid of him was to accept, which I did, and he left. I kept the flower in my car so my family wouldn't realize something was happening, and I threw it in a trash can outside later. This was the beginning of the week, and he started to wait for me after work, giving me drinks, and asking me out to the cinema or restaurant. I refused everything but ended up accepting the drinks to make him leave. During the weekend, I had a second job with late shifts at a fast food restaurant. On my first shift there since everything happened, I was closing the restaurant with three other colleagues. Since it was dark and late, one of us had to leave first and drive around the restaurant to ensure it was safe for everyone. I wouldn't normally do this, but that night I had a weird feeling he might be there. So, I volunteered for the drive, and right on the spot, he was parked next to my car. It was 1am. How long had he been waiting? I told him to go a bit further, otherwise, we couldn't leave, which he did. 
After my colleagues left, I stopped next to his car and opened the window to explain why I reacted that way. Not that I had to explain myself, but I thought maybe he'd follow me until I explained. Before I knew it, he opened his car door and got into my car. I just want to remind you that this man knew where I worked, where I lived, what my car looked like, and who my family was. And he was a neighbor, that's why I never wanted to make a scene. But at this very moment, I was scared for my life. A 27-year-old muscular guy, who I didn't really know, was in my car at 1 a.m. in an empty parking lot. He seemed talkative, and I didn't have any other choice, so I decided to listen to him. He said he arrived in the country in 2014, stayed in the capital for two years, and moved to our neighborhood in 2017. I did the math and realized a year was missing. I asked him about it. He answered, I was in jail. Just imagine how scared I was. Why were you in jail? Well, I didn't have papers, and I had a car accident. Okay, it wasn't that scary in the end, which did reassure me. The guy said good night and left. There were many times I checked the rearview mirror and saw he was right behind me. I wouldn't know since when, and even to this day, I check often to see if a car is following me. Once, during a late shift, I was washing dishes and texting friends, two guys, to let them know I was finishing so we could meet. I had to leave my phone, and maybe half an hour later, a colleague came to me and said, Hey, your friend ordered at the drive-thru and asked for you. Oh, yes, I told him I wanted to meet later. I took my phone and messaged my friends asking why they were asking for me at work. What are you talking about? At that moment, I realized that they weren't talking about the friends I had plans with. I rushed to my colleague and asked her to describe the guy and the car. It was Steve. There were so many instances of things like that happening. He followed me to my friends and would threaten to tell my dad that he'd seen me drinking with boys. Also, one of his friends, Carl, who I spotted in my parking lot, had also started following me. A friend who knew Carl told me he was married, had kids, and was 40 years old. I was so shocked. One evening, around 10 p.m., and it was already dark, I parked and saw a neighbor getting home. It had been a while since we talked, so he said he'd be back in two minutes so we could chat. While waiting, I was getting my stuff from the trunk. This is when the car parked behind me flashed its lights at me. I didn't have to turn around to guess who it was. I had been patient since nothing too crazy had happened, and I didn't want to scare or create problems for my family, but that night I was pretty pissed off, and it was happening right next to my place. I threw my stuff and rushed at the car. Both Steve and Carl were there. I told them to leave me and stop following me. Steve didn't say a word, and Carl just smiled and said good night. I didn't answer and left. It worked because they didn't bother me for months. Steve changed his car to a black one, which was still very recognizable. He followed me a few more times, and one day he tried to talk to me with a friend who could translate what he had to say. I explained to his friend that I wasn't interested, and that was the last time I talked to him. Months later, I saw a guy in my neighborhood, and I knew he lived in an apartment near where Steve lived. The whole thing was over, but it was always in the back of my mind. I didn't really know who the guy was and didn't know if this would start again. I was curious, and you know how curiosity is a bad thing. I started to talk to him. Hey, do you know the guy Steve that lives in your building? Oh yeah, the mechanic? No, the guy who owns the black car. Oh, you mean my dad? I froze. I have no idea how this conversation ended since it is still a big shock even to this day. I know I didn't tell him anything about his dad's behavior. I had known this kid for so many years and he was actually the son of this guy. And he had four brothers and sisters. Then I realized the guy had lied about his age because the kid was about 15 and I believed him like an idiot. This is not the end of the stunning discoveries. A few days later. I met a friend who knew about these events and told her that the kid was his son. 
She looked at me, shocked, and said, All this time it was this guy? What? You know him? He left his country because he stole money from powerful people and joined his family here but got jailed for suspicion of badly assaulting a woman. What? I remember that when he followed me, he would stop when I drove in the direction of the police station. I thought it was because he still had issues with his papers. She kept talking and showed me a video. This is his wife here, and the second woman is his second wife. She was so tired of him talking to other girls that she went to their country to find a second wife. I want to clarify that my friend was from the same country as this guy, but she was born here, which is why she had this kind of information. Small community, so they kind of all know each other. I was very lucky that nothing happened to me. I still can't believe it, and I wonder how it could have gone if I had acted differently. I was young and naive back then and didn't want to be offensive to anyone's culture, but in reality I really should have reported it sooner. This happened to me several years back. I was living with a friend at the time and was en route back to my apartment from a night with my family. I was kind of in a foul mood and was out of cigarettes, so I stopped at a gas station on my way back home. This gas station was dingy. I mean, just absolutely run down. The sad thing is that it was built that way. It was built to be barely functional. The lights outside didn't always work and the place always smelled of burnt rubber. It was kinda sketchy during the day, but at 10 o'clock at night, it took on a whole different air. However, I was seriously in need of cigarettes, so I stopped. I got out of my car, went inside, grabbed a bottle of Gatorade, and made my way to the counter, only to notice that there was no one standing there. I'd stopped by this gas station before and had the same thing happen, figuring they were either in the bathroom or at their house. The employees were all part of a family who lived on the premises, so I hung around for a few minutes. Soon enough, the door to the restroom flew open and out lumbered a rather angry-looking female. She rang me up for the Gatorade and gave me attitude when I said I wanted cigarettes. Which I totally didn't understand, it's like, you never get business. So on the rare occasion that someone wants to buy something, you should be grateful. And with that awkward encounter, I was on my way. Total time that had elapsed from my guy in my car to walking out of the door was maybe five minutes. I had a hanging light in my car that is always on while I'm driving. I was sure I'd left it on whilst I was in the store, but as I approached the car I noticed it was off. Not thinking much of it, I went to open my door and noticed that the car was unlocked. I never leave my car unlocked. But then again, I figured I was kind of in a hurry so it was possible. I got in, started my car, lit a cigarette, and kind of blindly backed out while opening my Gatorade. I recapped the bottle, put it in the seat next to me, and was about to pull onto the road when a hand reached out from the back seat. I was panicking, and my immediate thought was to turn around, but suddenly he says, don't turn around if you know what's good for you. I sat facing forward and asked him what he wanted. He said he wanted a ride somewhere. My phone was in my backpack on the floor of my passenger seat, too far to grab discreetly. I asked him where he wanted to go. He gave me directions to a well-known crack alley about four miles from where we were. I'd been to the area before. I used to deliver pizza in that part of town before switching to a relatively safer delivery area. As I drove, I kept trying to sneak glances at him in my rearview mirror but it seemed like every time I did, his face was encompassed by shadows. We got to the place he wanted to go, and he rolled the window down, yelling out some guy's name. That guy came over to my car and sold this intruder some gear through my back window. The whole time he mocked me and called me his new driver. After about 15 minutes, they were done. Once the dealer walked away, the man in the back seat told me to bring him back to the gas station where he had gotten into my car. The stretch of road to get back there is not well lit or well traveled after dark. 
but it's not like I've run into any more danger than I was already in. I just wanted him to get out of my car. As we drove back, he started trying to talk me up, which I thought was weird. I gave reasonable answers without revealing anything personal about myself. We were about halfway through our trip when he asked me to pull over on the side of the road. This stretch of road went over one of those man-made concrete ditches, which meant that there was a significant paint shoulder over that ditch. He had me pull over there and turn off the car. Do you believe in God? My heart started racing. I'm not sure. If you died tonight, do you think you'd see God? I don't know. I'd like to think so. Close your eyes. Put your hands on the steering wheel, push your head forward, and let it rest on the wheel. Trembling, I did as he commanded. Now count. What? Are you deaf? I said count. So I did. I started counting, slowly counting. My pace matched the seconds ticking by. I wondered how many more I have. I could tell he was shifting in the back seat. I thought I was about to die. Then he simply got out of the car and ran off. I kept counting. I counted to at least a thousand before I felt it might be okay to look up. I didn't want to look up to him standing in front of my car waiting for me to disobey. When I did finally look up, he wasn't there. I sped off toward my apartment, grabbed my phone, and called the cops. Naturally, they said there was nothing they could do. I didn't have a description of the guy other than that he was a male. I thought he might be black because I think that was the color of the skin I saw when I initially started to turn around, but it was so fleeting that I couldn't be certain. He didn't take anything out of my car or leave anything. I learned a few things that day. One, I never, ever, ever leave my car unlocked. Two, I always check my car before I get into it. Three, I'm never stopping at the gas station again. I no longer live there, so that helps. Four, if someone still somehow manages to get into my car to try something like that again, I'm running full speed into the nearest light post. I'll be wearing a seatbelt, and I doubt that some hijacker would worry about putting their seatbelt on. This happened about 20 years ago, and I don't think I will ever forget it. Back in those days, I was an apprentice hairdresser for one of the top five ranked stylists in Japan. Training in that profession at that level was very strict, and beauty standards were a bit different. You probably don't need me telling you that, but it's probably worth keeping in mind. Back to training, it was long, and the time off between sessions was pretty much non-existent. We were expected to be at training even during national holidays. I'm not sure if that was strictly by the books, but as impressionable young stylists, we couldn't be seen refusing training. I think I had about three or four days off for summer. I took them all at once, and a lot of my friends and co-workers used the time to head back to their hometowns and see families. Since I lived really close to where I was studying, I didn't want to use my time off just hanging around at home, I could do that any time. So, I accepted an offer from one of my seniors to visit his hometown. It was really late by the time I finished work, and we managed to get to my senior's hometown at around 2 a.m. The satellite navigation system told me that we were about 15 minutes away from arrival. The roads were dark and empty, we were the only ones on the road that late. He lived in the middle of nowhere, so that could have been a reason. I remember seeing empty fields on either side of the road. I kind of regretted coming already. I mean, what the hell were we going to do here? He should have probably mentioned that he lived in the rural countryside. I just watched the road and tried to stay awake. I should say that I was driving, I felt like driving since I didn't get to drive much. I might have changed my mind if I had known it was going to be that far to get to his family home. Then suddenly, something appeared out of the darkness in front of the car. A woman with no clothes came running down the opposite lane of the road towards us. I slammed on the brakes because I thought that I just witnessed the paranormal. 
she ran past us. I looked in the rearview mirror to see a woman between the ages of about 18 to 20 years old. She kept running, then she turned around and ran towards our car. I looked at my friend, and he had a look of disbelief on his face, and I guessed that I didn't have that much of a different look. I think the reality of the situation was we both didn't know what to do. I said to him, is that a ghost? I don't know, shall we just keep going, he replied. We slowly pulled away. I was very skeptical because I thought she looked so real. I made sure I kept to a low speed, and I kept checking the mirrors. The woman got closer, and I stopped the car and said to him, that's not a ghost, come on, we have to stop and see if she's okay. He agreed and said he would call out to her. It was so creepy to see someone running around in the middle of nowhere, even creepier if you haven't been to that place before. She kept on running past our car, so I tried to match her speed as my friend rolled down the window and tried to speak to her. Hey, you shouldn't be running around on the roads like that, this late at night, maybe you should head home, he said something like that. It wasn't very well put together or that sympathetic, I remember that much. She didn't even turn to face the car, she just said, hey, don't worry, I'm fine. It feels so good. I could see her a little closer now and guessed her age to be around 18 or 19 years old. Why are you like this? Have you been kidnapped? Has someone done something to you? It's really dangerous to be out here with no clothes and alone. We have to get you home, I said to her. She stopped running and looked down at the floor as if in thought, and then replied, I ran away from home. I don't even know where home is. I noticed at that point that she was actually wearing socks and shoes so at least her feet weren't too bad. She stood there with her hands behind her back, looking completely lost and confused. It was very odd. I couldn't leave her out here. I told my friend in a hushed voice that we had to help her, and he sighed but then nodded. We decided to take her to the nearest police station. I had a dress that belonged to one of my female colleagues at work in the back of my car. Long story short, I told the woman to throw it on and she reluctantly agreed. Once she was dressed and in the back seat, I turned to her and said, Right, if you can't remember where home is, I can take you to the police and we can figure it out from there, okay? To that, she responded with something outrageous. I hate the police, they're always on my dad's side. Please, can you just take me to a hotel? Hotels are safer than police for sure. You can stay there with me. Hold me tonight, I'm a virgin. We were young, but even though we were young and often threw caution to the wind, we knew that we had to get her somewhere safe. It's a scary world out there. If she said that to another pair of guys like us in the next car that came along, well, I don't even want to think about it. We told her that wasn't going to happen. She didn't say anything for a while, but then she handed me a piece of paper. I don't know where she got it from, but it had a name, a number, and the address of a hospital. My friend saw the address and said, Oh, I know that place. It was a psychiatric hospital. We called the number, and a voice that said it was the security department answered. I explained to the security guard what happened, and after we hung up, we got a call from the woman's mother. We found out where her mom lived and took her there. My friend said that he knew that side of town, but he had never been there before. The woman's mother was extremely apologetic over the phone. My friend spoke to her, and he said that he could tell that she was definitely genuine and sorry for the inconvenience. I felt sorry for her, it wasn't her fault. When we got to the house, we heard more about this situation from her mother. The woman we found out in the middle of nowhere had only just turned 18. She had been assaulted by her biological father when she was 16. A few days after he did what he did, she stabbed him in the neck with a box cutter knife. She was admitted to a mental asylum because of this attack. No one seems to know how she keeps getting out, but the mother said to us that this was the third time she'd successfully broken free. What a sensational story, I remember thinking. We drove the mother and daughter to the hospital at the mother's request. I could see how mentally tired she was by all of what had been going on. 
She was so polite and grateful, she really impressed me. I mean, with all that happened, she seemed to be incredibly in control of her own emotions. The girl didn't seem to say much, she seemed to like the dress we gave her. The mother apologized for not washing it before returning it, and we both agreed that no apology was necessary. Obviously, she got dressed into clothes of her own. She disappeared upstairs to change and then she came back, and we took off. She didn't say much when we were driving, she was taking being returned to the asylum a lot better than expected. I thought that she would be going kicking and screaming. Her mother spoke with her in the back as we drove, she said, you didn't get injured or anything when you were out, did you? No, I'm fine, the daughter responded. Oh, that's great, I'm relieved, the mother told her. We left them at the hospital and told them that we couldn't stay because we were already really late getting to my friend's parents' home. My friend's parents were really worried by the time we got there. I think that we both wanted to tell them everything about the situation, but we were too tired to go through it all again. At that point, I just wanted to go to sleep. I stayed with him and his family for three days. It was actually a really great time and just what I needed, a break from studies in the city. It was certainly going to be a trip I would never forget. We said our goodbyes to the family, and his little sister asked us for a ride to the station. I said that it wouldn't be a problem. Just before we dropped her off at the station, she said something that scared the hell out of me. Hey big bro, why does your friend have a box cutter stabbed in the back seat? So, a quick backstory, I used to live in a very small town, predominantly safe for kids, with only some drug issues. My house was located in a small upscale part of the town, most people who lived there were families. A small pond with lots of greenery in the neighborhood was about a five minute walk from my house. To get to the pond, you had to go down a grass hill. Neighborhood kids, including myself, would always go down to the pond for hours to catch frogs, skip rocks, and enjoy nature. Now, on to the story. On this particular day, it was rainy and pretty cold, so there were no other kids at the pond. My best friend, her brother, who was one year older than us, and myself, decided to head down to the pond for a bit. After about half an hour, we saw a minivan pull up at the top of the hill. We thought nothing of it, assuming it was probably someone stopping at the neighborhood mailbox. A man, probably in his 60s, got out. In our small town, everyone knew everyone, or at least recognized each other. I found it strange that I had never seen this man before in town or the neighborhood. He just stared at the three of us for what seemed like forever. Suddenly, he yelled at us, saying, It's not safe down there, you kids better come up here. My best friend and her brother looked terrified, and I had this gut feeling that something wasn't right. We didn't respond, but he kept repeating that phrase. It's not safe down there. You kids better come up here. Our fight or flight reaction kicked in, and we all sprinted up the other side of the hill, just a few meters away from him and the minivan. As soon as he saw us running, he got into his minivan and started driving slowly behind us, literally following us until we reached my house. Fortunately, my garage door was open and my parents' cars were parked inside. We hid behind one of my parents' cars and watched as he pulled to the side of my house and parked. My parents were inside, unaware of what was happening. He stayed parked in front of my house for a couple of minutes until my dad came outside to take out the trash and saw the three of us hiding. I guess the man saw my dad and drove away, but as soon as he left, we told my parents everything. Even now, 12 years later, my parents still think we were being overdramatic and that the man was genuinely concerned for our safety because of the weather. Nonetheless, we weren't allowed to go back to the pond anymore. I understand why they think this, the three of us tended to exaggerate things and be dramatic. However, I knew from the strange feeling I had when I first saw him at the top of the hill that something was off. To this day, 
I still believe he was planning something, but maybe it was just my childish imagination. I used to work in a hole-in-the-wall gas station in the sticks of North Carolina. I was freshly 18, had a new car, a rundown Chevy, but it got me from point A to point B, and was newly promoted to assistant manager, so I was working many late nights by myself. Truthfully, I loved working alone. My boss was super laid back, and his philosophy was, as long as the work gets done, do whatever you please. We even had a shotgun behind the counter, which he taught me to shoot on my first day there. So even though I would be there late, I always felt safe. On this particular night, it was extremely dead, so with my boss's permission, I closed the store early and hopped in my car. It was probably 11.30 to 12 a.m. at this point. Other than being able to get out of work early, this was my usual routine. Nothing seemed out of the ordinary. I texted my roommate to let her know I was getting home early, we always looked out for each other like that, lit up a cigarette, and then started on my way home. For those of you who don't know North Carolina very well, I'm going to provide a little bit of detail regarding the terrain. From where I worked at the gas station to where I lived, I had to drive down the back roads. These roads consisted of very dense woods on both sides. Sometimes, the woods would seem so thick that you really couldn't tell where you were. Especially at night. This could be intimidating to those who don't know the area, but honestly, I was more worried about deer jumping out in front of me, which was a common occurrence in this area. I'm driving down the road, blaring Nirvana, my favorite band at the time, and just being a typical 18-year-old grunge kid who had newly discovered the freedom of being an adult and getting off work. When all of a sudden, I see something in the middle of the road, probably 75 to 100 feet ahead. At first, I thought it was a deer, but it looked too small. So I started to gradually slow down, ultimately coming to a stop. I have to wear glasses when I drive. I mainly need them at night, but my eyesight isn't terrible enough for me to make it a habit. I grabbed my glasses and put them on. Now being able to see much more clearly, I almost shat myself at what I saw. It was a woman. An older woman, wearing what looked like a nightgown of some kind. Her hair was in disarray, she had her hands behind her back, and she was just standing there, in the middle of the road, just staring at me in my car. Let me remind you, we are practically in the middle of nowhere. There are trees as far as my headlights can shine, and it's midnight. I'm naturally paranoid, so all sorts of questions were running through my head. Who is this woman? Where did she come from? It's midnight. Are my doors locked? Why is she out here at midnight? Should I honk my horn at her? Should I call the police? What if she has Alzheimer's and doesn't know where she is? Or what if she's an escape patient? Even though the closest mental facility was three to four cities away, I didn't exclude that possibility. I thought about calling the cops, but I got my phone and of course, there was no cell service. This encounter went on for a while, just sitting in the middle of the road, mentally questioning what was happening. It's now way past midnight, she's still standing there, just staring at me with this zoned out look, hands behind her back as if she's observing me. I'm starting to get tired of this, considering that I had to be up early for work the next morning. So I honked my horn at her. I didn't expect what happened next. This woman's face turns from being spaced out to complete rage and she raised her arms up. It looked like she was holding something in her hand. She lets out this horrid animalistic scream and charges at my car. As she ran closer, I realized she was holding something sharp. It looked like a kitchen knife or a piece of jagged glass. During this moment of horror, I had a brief flashback to my stepdad giving me advice when I first got my license. If an animal ever runs out in front of you, turn it into a speed bump I love animals, so I couldn't bear to hear that. But this time, I was taking my stepdad's advice. 
I was going to turn this psycho into a speed bump. Serve the Servants by Nirvana started playing on the radio. I mention this because the song has much to do with the aura of the moment. As if it was in sync with this instance in time, the intensity of the song enabled me to let out the most intimidating primal scream that I could. Loud enough for her to hear it. The window was open because I had been smoking, and I hit the gas. She was running towards my car like she was going to jump on my hood. I guess she realized I had the utmost intent to hit her, in which at this point, the woman zigzags away from my car and runs off into the woods. Still in fight mode, I didn't question where this woman went. I was just glad that she was gone, so I accelerated on the gas and sped the entire way home. I got home at almost 1.30 a.m. My roommate was still awake, waiting up for me the entire time. She was extremely worried because it was way past the time I said I was going to be home. She had been texting and calling me. When I pulled up to her house, I got all of her texts and missed calls at once, so I started to explain to her what happened. My body went from fight mode to panic as I was recounting everything that happened. My roommate's mother was a 911 operator who also happened to be working that night. So she decided to text her mom to see if there were any silver alerts in the area. Immediately, her mom texted back and said there wasn't. That alone gave me goosebumps to the core of my being. There was no explanation as to where this lady came from. I used to work in a residential care facility, and for a number of years, I worked with a woman named Kajiri. She was generally okay to work with but she could be intense. The sort of joking flirtation that often found its way into high-pressure environments was common throughout the whole team, but when she directed it at me, it didn't seem so jokey. It took me forever to realize, because I usually didn't notice someone flirting with me until someone else pointed it out six months later. But when she started trying to give me jewelry and chocolate bouquets, I finally started to pick up on it. In between things being normal and actually maybe not really normal, there was a long escalation of text messages, comments that made me uncomfortable, personal space violations, dropping by my house uninvited, hanging around on my shift hours after hers had finished, unwanted touching, etc. As mentioned, I can be slow to catch on. Once I realized what was happening, I put as much distance between us as possible. I stopped answering calls and texts, locked down social media, spoke to other colleagues and had them running interference. A lot of interference, actually. At the time, it kind of became a joke, but looking back, it was all kinds of messed up. She even parked outside my house sometimes, and I'd sit in the back room with the light off so she'd think I wasn't home. After a couple of months of my disappearing woman act, she seemed to get the hint and backed right off. I was pleased. We all got on with our lives and lived happily ever after. Yeah, not quite. A few months after it died down, I heard through the grapevine that Kajiri seemed to have focused her attentions on another co-worker Linda. Linda and I had a close mutual friend, but didn't know each other well. I didn't think much other than good luck, you poor sucker. A few months later again, and I got a call out of the blue from a mutual friend. Without preamble, he asked, were you dating Kajiri? Um, no, I don't swing that way. I was shocked. He had been privy to all the awkward details of my experience with Kajiri and had helped run interference. He explained that he had been talking to Linda and she asked about my relationship with Kajiri. The story that followed still sounds too fantastical to have actually happened in an actual sensible grown-up workplace. Kajiri had been catfishing her own best friend Amanda, posing as Linda. In a string of emails, fake Linda and Amanda had discussed Kajiri's drug problem, her abusive and dangerous ex, none other than yours truly. There was a story about fake Linda coming out to her family after her brother caught her in bed with Kajiri, and more. The jig was up when Linda got a second job, coincidentally with Amanda's husband, who mentioned how great it was to finally meet Kajiri's girlfriend. 
which was a complete shock to Linda when she learned about herself that she was no longer a straight woman and had a girlfriend. So essentially, Kajiri moved on from me, found a new target, started emailing Amanda from a fake account, pretending to be Linda. She told all these stories about being with Kajiri, about how I was an abusive ex, and how Linda was caught by her family being with a woman and all the drama that it caused. She made up a bunch of insane stories to justify her creepy obsessive fantasies and was telling them to Amanda and other people from a fake email to make it sound like the stories were from the fake girlfriend and Kajiri couldn't be accused of making it up. Here's some highlights of the stories Kajiri had been telling to Linda, her friends, and other co-workers I wasn't close to, she picked her audience very carefully. That Linda and I had physically fought, at work, over Kajiri. That I had an orgy in the staff office on a night shift with Kajiri and two male co-workers. That Kajiri and I had broken up after I cheated on her with another male co-worker, not one of the orgy ones, I was really getting around apparently. That I would drug her against her will. That we had planned to have children using a sperm donor, but that I couldn't decide who would have the baby. This woman had been living out a full-on soap opera and using her co-workers and friends as characters. Linda and I reported her to management and she was immediately suspended, pending investigation. She quit two days later. Unfortunately, HR decided they needed to continue their investigation of the allegation that I had an orgy at work. Because that was totally plausible and not at all made up by a crazy woman. They put me through hell investigating this imaginary story about me and two men and another woman. Even though the only men in our department are twice my age and happily married. It made me never want to trust HR again. I left that job a month later myself and when I interviewed for my current job, she had interviewed half an hour before me. And they were looking to hire two people. She didn't get the job, but there have been two other openings since, and she applied for both of them. I'm terrified of meeting her again. It turned out she has a history of inpatient psych treatment for delusional behavior and was known to be obsessive about people she took a liking to. According to Facebook, her current girlfriend has a similar first name as me and shares more than a few physical similarities. She still knows where I live. So I'm pretty sure that the current situation is that she's still telling people that I'm her girlfriend, all while she's desperately applying for any job she can get at my new workplace. Okay, so I wasn't conventionally, nor classically pretty. I was the duff in any friend group I found myself in. I never worried about being hit on, disrespected, or kidnapped. Safety concerns were never an issue for me when going out because I was never the one anyone wanted to get to know or be around, I was just too plain. It was always me who had to look out for my friends, male and female alike. I used to go to a local bar almost daily. I didn't drink alcohol there, I just ordered a regular coke and waited for my ride home. It was my usual hangout spot after work, so I sat, chilled, and minded my own business. A few weeks ago, I had just finished work and was sitting at my regular spot, sipping my drink while working on a new pendant I was making. I had started wire wrapping crystals into jewelry. I didn't expect anyone to strike up a conversation with me knowing I basically blended into the walls, despite the staff knowing me and paying me slight attention and being nice to me. But this weird guy I'd never seen before came over and sat at my table across from me. I was surprised and engaged in a small conversation that I can't even remember how I started, but he began asking me a few questions about myself that seemed normal and flowed together, so I didn't think much of it. Again, being plain, I didn't think anyone would take interest in me. By then, I had drunk three glasses of soda and needed to use the restroom, so I grabbed my phone and purse and went. When I returned a few minutes later, I resumed working since none of my stuff had been touched. I called a waitress over, asked for a new drink, and she nodded. It had always been engraved in me that you never leave your drink unattended. If you do, either have it remade or leave it to the bartender. As the waitress was reaching for my old drink, 
which only had a few sips taken out of it, the guy got a bit agitated, saying I was being wasteful for ordering a new drink. I looked at him, eyebrows raised in confusion, and asked why it was his concern. It was my money after all, and refills were free. He then accused me of making more work for the waitress for no reason. Annoyed, I told him firmly that it was my business and if he didn't like it, he could leave. He attempted to wave off the waitress changing my drink, but I had enough of his nonsense and flatly said, you drink it, if you think it's such a waste. It seemed to catch him off guard. He looked shocked, then a bit angry, before storming off. I then handed the drink to the waitress, expressing unease about the guy I was talking to, and asked her to inform the bartender to keep an eye on him. I requested to have my drink dumped out and only water served from then on. I left for home after being picked up shortly after, and the next day after work, I found out he had been arrested for assault. I only found out today what exactly had happened. Apparently, he had gotten into a fight with the bartender working that night. The bartender caught him tampering with the girl's drink while she wasn't looking and prevented her from drinking it. The guy got angry, leading to a physical altercation. The cops were called, and now he's awaiting trial. It turns out he was trying to see if he could take advantage of someone like me, someone who always let her guard down due to low confidence. He thought I'd be an easy target with just a little attention. When I didn't consume my drink upon returning, he targeted another girl. If he truly was targeting me, I had to question his sanity and sobriety.